joining me. Um, I'm really excited to talk about folks that are looking into medicine. Um, as you guys already know, I do a different kind of medicine. So this will be um, a perhaps a variation of some of the things that you have uh, already been talking about. But a little bit about me. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Dr. Anna Maria Temple, and I am a general pediatrician trained in a regular medical school um, at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And my journey began actually in Romania. I'm from Romania. And when I was five years old, my daughter, my sister, my daughter, my sister um, had recurrent abdominal pain. And it was every single night, my mom would be holding her on the ground um, and crying because she had this awful belly pain. We got dragged to so many doctors. I have I got dragged in taking tons of disgusting medications because they thought maybe she had parasites. So then they had to treat the whole family. Anyway, long story short, she ends up being diagnosed with celiac disease. And at that time in communist Romania in 1978, um, Celiac disease and gluten-free was a problem. We didn't even have food, much less gluten-free food. And so I watched my mom struggle with feed, trying to find food for my sister, trying to make my sister eat. She would eat like food and keep it in the side of her cheek and then spit it out during her sleep time. So it would be sitting like on the nightstand. So disgusting. She really loves that I tell this story. So, um, But I think it was really at that time that I started really thinking of my career path, which is really weird. But since the age of five, I wanted to be a pediatrician and not just a doctor. It was always pediatrics. And whenever I'm questioned about it, I was like, you know, I really think that watching my sister be in so much pain, I wanted to be a doctor who just made kids pain go away. And even more importantly, prevented kids from ever being in pain. Because my goal has been is and will always be, how do we prevent chronic disease? And I think it started when I was five and that's why I was gonna be a pediatrician. Anyway, fast forward to us emigrating to the United States. That's another story for another time. In 2007, I was already in my medical practice. I was working full-time as a hospitalist and all three of my children were plagued by chronic disease. My youngest one, who's two, had seasonal allergies that were so horrible that he could not walk outside for an Easter egg hunt because his eyes would swell shut, his tears would stream down his face, his body would be covered in hives, and he would be writhing on the ground, scratching his body and screaming from the discomfort of spring allergies. My daughter, six of the time, had chronic asthma, chronic eczema, chronic allergies, every ear, cold turned to an ear infection or croup. She was on antibiotics, steroids. She had chronic And then my middle child, he was what we call disgusting. He had a kind of snot that like, when you see a child walk down the street, you're like, where's his mother? And how is this even allowed? There were not enough tissues in Costco to take care of that situation. And also he had ADHD. Anyway, one day I took my three kids to their doctor because I was done with this three ring circus and I needed to know what is the reason my kids are so sick. I'm a pediatrician. How can they be so sick? And at that time, they're like, well, for the little one, you know, there's nothing else we can do because he's already on five medications. The only option is allergy shots. He was two years old. For my daughter, they said, well, as long as she takes inhaled steroids every day, her asthma will be under control and she does topical steroids every day, her eczema is gonna be under control and she'll just take her allergy medicines to keep her asthma and to keep her eczema under control. And she'll outgrow her ear infections and will eventually outgrow croup. As for the middle one, he's just gross. And I think I stopped paying attention around that time because I don't even know what they said about the ADHD. I walked out of that office and I was five years into my medical practice and I had no answers. I could not understand what was going on, but my mama instinct kicked in and she was like, there's no way that these children are going to be on medicines for the rest of their lives, that this is their story. I went home and a week later, I went to my kid's uh, school where a nutritionist gave a talk. And it was on that Tuesday at 7.30 in the morning, that I realized the root cause of my children's chronic disease, 
It's like the fog lifted and I t- I saw what the problem was. All she talked about was sugar. And I went home and I cleaned that pantry to the horror of the whole family. And I out went the Lucky Charms, the Cinnamon Toast Crunch, because I mean, they're delicious. The Doritos, the chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, ramen noodles. Sorry, my people. The uh, juice boxes, the chocolate milk, you name a piece of garbage, including Pop-Tarts, most delicious breakfast in the world, were thrown out. And at that time is when I became an outcast in my family. My husband and I fought for five years over how I fed the children. My friends thought I had lost my mind. My family wrote me out of their will. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure at some point somebody scratched me off. And then my medical partners were like, where's the medical evidence behind this stuff that you're doing at home? And I was like, well, I don't know where the medical evidence is because Google wasn't really like running where where it is right now because it was a long time ago. But I knew that there couldn't be the wrong answer to get rid of garbage and bring in fruits and vegetables into my children's diet. And over the next five years, because I persevered and I didn't care what anybody said, and I moved on with whatever I needed to do, my children came off their antibiotics. They no longer needed steroids. They no longer needed inhaled medication. All the allergy medicines went away. We never had to do allergy shots. And then about nine years into the journey, my family and I, we actually, my husband's an orthopedic surgeon. He and I, we quit our jobs and we moved to New Zealand in 2016, where we had no health insurance, no medications, no doctors. And my children thrived. They climbed the highest mountains, then bungee jumped off the tallest bridges. And at that time, as I realized what it's like to come back from chronic disease, that chronic disease is not the rest of the story. But as I was going through this journey, what I noticed is my, as my kids got better, my medical advice to my patients changed. And then their questions were different. So my research was different. And then lo and behold, in New Zealand, I had the space and time because in New Zealand, you don't have malpractice. There's no lawyers to sue you if you do the wrong thing. Not that you want to do the wrong thing, but there's no fear of malpractice. And we didn't have Google reviews to, um, to, for your bonus to the hospital. The hospital just said, please take care of our patients. So I was able to research deeper and lo and behold, I found functional medicine. And functional medicine means taking care of the whole human body through nutrition, through exercise, through de-stressing, through environment, through sleep, through the basics, because the human body knows what to do. Us humans have polluted the human body with thinking that we're smarter than mother nature and we've created huge problem. So while I was in New Zealand, I was able to treat families just with holistic, what we're gonna talk about in a second, practices where they had to do lifestyle modifications and 90% of my patients got better. The other 10%, I needed a little more time. And then when we returned to the States in 2018, I wasn't gonna go back to my former practice. I started my own practice and now I'm able to treat you know, children from babies on preventing chronic disease and those who suffer from chronic disease were able to turn it around using approaches that were invented like hundreds and thousands of years ago. It's really nothing really special. So, but that is how we, I ended up from a traditionally trained doctor to now practicing um, holistic medicine. And I was just gonna show you a couple of things. So, oh, geez. Hold on a second. All right. It's going. No, it's not. Oh my gosh. Now I'm sharing. Now you can see how terrible I am at. Hold on a second, folks. I can do this. This is what I wanted to do. Okay. All right. So these are my babies. This is when they were little tiny. And this is, these are my babies in New Zealand. This is when we did our Hobbiton tour um, without we didn't even take as much as one Tylenol the year and a half that we were there as an example. So a couple of things I wanted to talk to you guys. So I try, I practice at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, is where I did medical school. I did residency in uh, med peds. I did combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at uh, Penn State. And it was all very traditional. 
And what I and then I moved to New Zealand and practiced medicine. And what I learned is that we're really close-minded in the United States, unfortunately. We only learn about American studies. We, you know, if a study is done in Iran or Turkey, I would say that I'm, I'm so, that's not, I mean, we're not, we can't really give it any credibility. Why not? Why are we the best? When I went to New Zealand, I'll tell you that in New Zealand, part of your residency program, you actually have to travel around the world and, and work in different hospitals in different countries to learn how different societies and cultures have different approaches to medicine, which is so incredibly amazing. I learned so much. You know, I walked into the New Zealand hospital thinking I was like, I'm an American. I know everything. And I was humbled by the fact uh, that they were so incredibly well-trained and so well-rounded. And I was almost embarrassed that my residency was only at one hospital in one city, one town in one country where everyone around me had been doing residency all over the world. So I've learned in my journey that being open-minded benefits me. Here's an example. When somebody comes to you and says, well, I have a cold, I'm just using that as a cold and or an ear infection, you know, most of us are like, oh, we need antibiotics. Open-minded is like, well, what else can we be doing? Are there any dietary things we can do? Are there chiropractic maneuvers we can do? Are there herbals? Are there essential oils? In traditional model, if anyone brings up anything besides antibiotics, it's like, there's no evidence, there's nothing been done, there's no studies. And it is a very close-minded unit. And a lot of times people feel very offended when a patient brings in an idea of like vitamin D or brings in a, on a, a question about echinacea. Because when you are not trained in it and you're like, well, I went to the best medical school that ever was and fellowship, if there was merit to this, I would learn about it. It is not possible for us to know everything there is to know about medicine. We must approach medicine. The best advice I got as a medical student was every day is a school day. And every day we have to listen with a different eye, I'm oh, different eye, different ear. You know, I used to be like, oh, that just, there's no medicine there's no medical evidence. And now I'm just like, I don't know. I'm very comfortable saying, I don't know. It does take some expertise because when you're fresh, when you're a med student and you feel like everyone judges you, when you're in residency and you feel like everyone judges you, when your first year is in practice and you feel like you know nothing and you feel like everyone judges you, it's very hard to say, I don't know. It is the most beautiful phrase and the patients really treasure that and accept that. And if you say, I don't know, but let me look into it. It is amazing the things that you are gonna find to learn. The other day I learned about a new herb because one of my 20 year olds who is fighting and beating diabetes as we speak said, you know what? Listen at a podcast about fenugreek. Do you think fenugreek can regulate my blood sugars? And I was like, I don't know, never heard about, I've heard about fenugreek. I've never heard it in the context. So after we got off our, from our appointment, I went, looked it up. Sure enough, tons of research with exact grams of fenugreek and how to take it and double blind placebo control studies, peer reviewed journal articles, there it was. So we often say, oh, if it was in a major journal, I would know Well, that was in a major journal. I've never heard of it. I've been now in practice for 25 years. That's the power of being open-minded. Now I know with my next patient that has diabetes, we may talk about fenugreek, which I would have never known about unless one of my patients brought it to me. Did it mean that I'm not less educated? Does it mean that I'm less educated, that I'm ignorant? That No, it just means that there's so much information out there that I need my whole village. I need all of you. I need all my people on Instagram to actually pay attention and raise the question so I could look into it. My dog is now coming into view. Hi. Holistic approach. What does holistic mean? You know, um, I get bombarded all the time and, or slash criticized all the time. People think holistic just means you use herbals. That's not, that's, that is not what it means. I want you guys to look at this plant and I, because I have my whole presentation, I can't see chat, but I want you guys to put in the chat when you look at this plant, what comes to mind? Just type in chat and my, my friends here are gonna check it out and McKenna's gonna 
read some of the things out. I want you guys to tell me what comes to mind when you see this picture. Um, we have needs water, needs water, dehydrated, dying, needs nutrients, lack of sunlight, needs sunlight, needs water. So it just needs those right. essential need, things. Right, needs all these things. Did, did McKenna, do you see, or Natalie, do you see anyone in the chat put, I think that there, this is a uh, plant suffering from eczema, that we're suffering from psoriasis. This plan has depression. This plan has anxiety, right? Those are all diagnoses. And in the traditional model, that's how we're taught. You see somebody in front of you, oh, they have, um, what is the diagnosis that they have, right? Or like everyone's like, what's your diagnosis? Like, what do you have? You're like, uh, I don't. Uh. When I look at a child in functional medicine, in holistic medicine, when we look at a child that looks like this, we're not looking at like, oh, what is this diagnosis? We look at the child and think, what do they need? Do they need sunshine? In other words, they've been on their screens too long and they need to be outside in the sunshine to get more vitamin D, right? Do they need more water? Because they're drinking so much soda and so much Gatorade and so many added it, um, flavored waters because they think they're doing something good. But in fact, they're actually dehydrated, even though they're drinking liquids, because as you guys might know, when you drink caffeinated drinks and sugary drinks, they're actually dehydrating. Should anyone be drinking alcohol? That's a major dehydrator. You're like, oh, I've been drinking vodka sodas. That is a major dehydrator of your body. So just because you're drinking liquids doesn't mean you're hydrated. So do, does the child need more water? Nutrients. Oh, but they're eating, of, they're eating all the time. They're eating me out of house and home. They're actually chubby. Most of Americans are actually nutrient deficient, even though they're overweight, because in our diet, in our American diet, we, it's filled with garbage, preservatives, food colorings, chemicals that are actually not food. So these children appearing in front of me that look like this, and they may be overweight, generally are nutrient deficient, so they need more nutrients. And soil, is their soil good? What does that mean? The soil is their environment. How is their home environment? Are they raised in a family of stress? I mean, we have a pandemic, folks. So in a pandemic where the, the parents are homeschooling their kids, parents have to work from home. The, there's some people are losing their jobs. People are losing their homes. There's so much stress. So what is the environment like? So when we talk a holistic approach, we look at the child and the whole child and what do they need from nutrition to sleep, to movement, to the environment, to too many toxins, to all these things, rather than like, what is the skin on the child or what is the the ear infection, let me do the antibiotic to the ear because remember the skin is not an organ that lives by itself. This organ, the skin is part of your whole body. So if your skin's affected, your kidneys are affected, your lungs are affected. So oftentimes we'll see kids that have um, eczema, which moves to asthma, which moves to seasonal allergies. It's called the allergic march because the skin doesn't live by itself. It lives in an environment of inflammation and that inflammation is affecting all our organs. Great example is I have a lot of kids that come in with eczema and then we treat the eczema. The eczema gets better from the inside out, not with creams or lotions, but from the inside out. And lo and behold, the parents are like, the kids are not as annoying. They're not as ordinary. They're not as irritable because they had neurological inflammation along with the skin inflammation. So looking at the whole person is really important. Whether you wanna be a surgeon, a neurologist, a dermatologist, the whole person is the key to helping this patient overcome what they're dealing with. But this becomes overwhelming, right? When you hear somebody, and especially when you're in the pre-medical mindset and you want, that means you wanna help people. And so people want your advice and you're like, how should I treat I don't know, this wart. And you're like, oh, and then do this and this and this and this. And then they're like, oh. or when you're applying, when you're studying and you need to know uh, everything there is to know about, I don't know, uh, cellulitis, which is infection of the skin, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I have like three chapters. And but we all begin with a first step. So when you give advice, when you're learning, when you're studying, when you're trying to figure something out for you or for your patients or for your family or friends, always begin with first step. The first step in our clinic, a lot of our patients are like, you're a holistic doctor or integrative, so therefore you're gonna give us supplements. And I'm like, no, 
<laughs> you have to change your diet. And they're like, what? I was like, yeah, there's no supplements. The first thing you have to do, and I leg- this is legitimately the plan, like in my medical notes, one grape at breakfast, one carrot slice at lunch, and one piece of broccoli at dinner. We'll see you in two weeks. And everyone's like, what? Like well, they're, everyone's waiting for this like major plan because they spend a lot of money with me. And so they're like, what is this amazing plan that's going to come together? And I'm like, no, no, the one grape. We're still at one grape. And when you pass the one grape, we're going to move to a grape and a strawberry <laughs> because you have to start slow. Otherwise, people give up in our journey. You know, in my recent book that I put in the first the book begins with my journey because people look at me now and then they're like, oh, and you do smoothies and you eat all these organic and you cook fresh and you work out every day and your kids work out every day. Folks, that was not what that looked like 12 years ago. It was a complete mess of a show where we were still eating um, uh, cinnamon toast crunch. And I was trying to give it a cinnamon toast crunch. And I was like, okay, we are now going to, you know, it was like week two. And I was like, the way we're going to get rid of cinnamon toast crunch, we are going to put a smoothie in front of them. How do you think my kids are going to drink a green smoothie after they've been eating Lucky Charms and cinnamon toast crunch for years? Heck no. So my first step was I'm going to make a smoothie. And my smoothie was ice cream with good ingredients. Yep. Ice cream, strawberries and whole milk. That was a smoothie. And my children drank it every day and they drank more of it every day and ate less cereal. And you may go ice cream. That's dumb. But then what I did is over time, I started removing the ice cream and adding yogurt and then remove more ice cream, add a yogurt, a little bit of raw honey, then removed a little more Then I added mangoes to make it sweet, then bananas, then a couple of leaves of spinach to the, today's smoothie, which is like 12 plant points. I'll tell you about plant points in a second, but in order to get like 12 different kinds of plants in a smoothie, which I couldn't have started that today. So, but we started really slow and moved gently through the process, giving myself grace that I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And then over time, now my kids do 12 plants in their smoothies every morning. So just start with one step. Another one, just do you, you know, in what the heck does that mean? A lot of times where we can be, you know, in the era of social media, I don't know if you guys have watched Social Dilemma, if you haven't, you should. It's we are being bombarded by so and so is doing this and so and so is doing that. And did you see their Instagram account? Ooh, did you see how many likes they have? All their friends on Snapchat. Oh my gosh, their TikTok following. And we start feel starting. It's hard not to compare yourself. I do the same thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why did he get so many likes? How come the engagement is so high? Maybe I need to post the way they're posting. And I'm like, hold up, hold up. I have my voice. I have my agenda. I have my passion, my drive, and I'm just going to keep going with that. And if a lot of people don't like it right now, it's all right. Eventually they will. Here's another good example. Because of my medical issues, I've had to go gluten and dairy free a long time ago. And my family has been riding my booty and criticizing and pointing fingers and carrying on and the drama about how ridiculous I am. What is the point? You don't have celiac disease. How ridiculous. You're so hoity. I mean, it goes on and on. You get the picture. Well, anyway, what's been happening over the past mm, two and a half years is that several family members have fallen ill to different chronic ailments. And lo and behold, everyone has been like this. What are you doing? Like what? So gluten-free? Okay, so how do I do gluten-free? Oh, dairy-free? Oh, what kind of cheese should I get? Do you think that, and people are getting better? Do you know now that over 50% of my family is gluten-free and dairy-free and feeling amazing because of, I'm not saying everybody should be gluten and dairy-free. What I'm saying is that they were feeling unwell as my mother's 74, my mother-in-law's 72, my sister-in-law's 48, my nephews are in their you know late 20s and stuff. So they've developed different, issues over time. And then lo and behold, everybody's like, what are you doing? And in fact, in my neighborhood, a lot of people have criticized me and didn't want to have me over because it's really annoying when I come over there. They don't want to show me their pizza and they don't want to show me their soda. They feel really embarrassed and feel judged. And now 
probably like half of my friend group is now seeing me in clinic because their children have developed issues and now their kids are getting better. So now everybody's jumping on the train. The point of that is you do you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're going to be upset by the criticism. You're going to be upset by what everybody is saying because everyone has opinions. Everyone's got to tell you something that they think that they know that their friend's friend and their brother, their sister, you know, you know what I'm saying? Do you, and then you'll be amazed on how people start following along some sooner than others. I always like joke, I'm not, I am never like quick to the finish line. I've always been the turtle, the tortoise, you know, in the hair and the tortoise race, I'm the tortoise. I just move slowly at my pace. And then I just pick and the momentum picks up as I keep going. I've been at this for, you know, a long time. I'm just gonna use Instagram because it's just numbers that you can see, but I've been doing Instagram since 2007. I think that's when it came out, 2010. Okay, whenever it came out, I can't even say, that's 2000, that's ridiculous, it wasn't then. Whenever it started, very soon after, it was like the worst Instagram page. And then I was in New Zealand and during New Zealand, I started reinventing my page, trying to get more traction to do more education. Maybe went up to 2000. And then I just kept doing what I was doing. And then all of a sudden it picked up to 10, it picked up to 20, it picked, you know, we're now at 30. I mean, it's just, but it wasn't because I was doing anything different. I just kept doing what I'm usually doing. And then, you know, I ended up publishing a book and now I have my own practice. And let me tell you, if you knew how many naysayers have been in my path, you'd be shocked. And then lastly, whenever you're in doubt of what's going on with yourself, with your body, with your patient in front of you, always go down to the, back to the five pillars of wellness, back to that plant, back to the things that are missing. The five pillars of wellness are nutrition. I would probably 50% of my book is dedicated to nutrition because it all begins with what we put in our bodies. Simple biological thing you guys have all learned. Here's a question for you. Ladies, I want you to monitor the chat. I want you guys to put in there, what does the body need to make cells? What does the body use? Like every day we wake up and the body needs stuff in order to make cells and to make hormones. What does the body need? We have water, glucose, vitamins, nutrients, oxygen, carbon, food, essential nutrients. Um, Great. Love. Nutrients. Carbs. Yep. Yeah. Carbs, glucose. Where does all that come from? That comes from food. And here I'm going to dispel, dispel a myth. There's no such thing as junk food. There's junk and then there's food. And when we treat our body with garbage, because it's delicious. Do you know how many of my patients are like, but Dr. T, um, the Doritos are really yummy or um, Takis are so delicious. And I'm like, that is why my job is so hard because humans have sat in a lab and created these delicious products that are made to make our taste buds so addicted. And I have to compete, you know, we, the, the Takis, Mother Nature has competed against Takis. Mother Nature makes a tomato. And so the tomatoes doesn't have an explosion in your mouth. A tomato is a tomato and a cucumber as well, a cucumber. And we have to compete against Doritos and Takis. And, but when you treat, when you give your body garbage, the body makes garbage cells. And that's why we have allergies, asthma, eczema, ADHD, focus issues, anxiety, depression. It all comes from the food we eat. Then what if you eat all the great foods, but you're still not better? Back to our environment. Are you on your screens all the time? We're all addicted, right? Back to the, the social dilemma that we all must watch. We're all addicted to um, the, our computers, to our screens, right? If you need a recipe, it's on your phone. If you need directions, it's on your phone. If you want a song, it's on your phone. You, wanna, you miss your friends, it's on your phone. So we are all addicted and attached to our phones and we have become indoor creatures. We're no longer outside. The lack of outdoor activity has depleted us of vitamin D. And if we might've heard this in the literature anywhere, that low vitamin D levels are associated with high risk of getting COVID and higher COVID complications. Because this virus is not a new virus. We're all walking around like, this is a novel virus. Oh, it is so such an evil virus. It is not an evil virus. It is a virus like all other viruses. 
we humans have had an immune system that has been with us since the beginning of mankind for thousands of years. Viruses have tried to attack us for thousands of years. Why is this virus shutting down the world unprecedented? Because we're the sickest that we've ever been. We're the most inflamed, the most vitamin deficient people, the most dehydrated people, the most indoor people that have ever lived on the planet. Because of our habits, we become so inflamed. So this virus is having a field day taking us out. Again, the virus is not more powerful, we're just sicker. Our immune systems are weaker. So when we focus on the five pillars of wellness, which are gonna be our nutrition, sleep, movement, stress, and our environment, we are gonna build strong immune systems and we can defeat viruses, bacteria, fungus, whatever comes in our way. But if our immune system is weak, we are prey to a pandemic and we're locked in our houses behind plexiglass and behind masks. So. What I, the takeaways that I want you guys to um, think, I want you to be open-minded, understand that the human body does is not one organ in space. It's one organ amongst a big puzzle of other organs and environments. It's a big picture and it's not just the body, it's the environment, the community, and it goes way beyond just the one organ that you might specialize in. You do you. Just keep on the track that you chose and keep on moving at your speed, at your pace. And the five, now I lost my other one. How long my five one was? And remember the five pillars of wellness. And that's all I want to tell you. So I'm ready to take some questions. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll probably... Um, stop around four central time, so five Eastern. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions. Um, your Instagram, Dr. Anna Maria. Um, yeah, so Instagram is uh, D-R-A-N-A Maria Temple. And on it, I put continuous tips on stuff. I know, I think somebody said that, um, you know, with classes can be really expensive. They can. I'll tell you, you don't have to get, there's a lot of free stuff out there. And, you know, starting with my Instagram content, I, it's continuous stuff. I mean, people, are, I wrote a book based on the blogs that I put out together. You can get the book and you just start there. Um, it's 14, $13.99 or on Kindle is $7.99 on Amazon. Um, oh, where'd it go? Reagan said lifestyle changes can be really hard and can even be class issues because of how expensive it can be to maintain. How would you engage with patients that might have those barriers? That is so great. And you know, that comes across all the time. So in New Zealand, that was all they were like, you don't understand it's expensive. I was like, it's actually not. It's a mindset that is expensive because you can walk outside and it's free. Now, some people live in terrible neighborhoods and they cannot walk outside and they might have to take the bus to somewhere else. Generally speaking, most people live in neighborhoods where you can take a walk or the kids go to school or a park where you can walk safely, but walking outside is free. You don't feel like walking outside. You know what? YouTube videos to work out in the house are free. I post uh, all the time about my family and how we work out actually at home. We have our equipment at home. You don't even need equipment, but we do. We got like, I don't know, like $6, $7 weights from, from uh, Target. So that's movement. Sleep, sleep is free. When we sleep, we detox. So a lot of people are like, oh, we're, I need this juice cleanse and I need this supplement and I need this other fancy program. No, you don't. You need to drink water, poop every day, pee all the time, sweat, sleep. When we go to sleep, we actually detox our body. At night is when the body actually wakes up and our immune system wakes up and it starts working and doing the job. As far as the environment, most people spend so much money on these chemicals because we've heard from the pandemic people that we need to Lysol everything when in fact bleach actually worsens illnesses and chronic disease. There's like these simple cloths that I have for like $30 that I don't even use any chemicals. So I don't buy any more chemicals for my house that we just clean the house with water and vinegar, much cheaper. You can wash your clothes, water, vinegar, baking soda, lemon juice. 
cheaper. Um, as far as the foods, the reason it's expensive is because when people change their habits, they go, I'm going to keep buying my chips, my Doritos, my cereal, and then add an apple. So I'm usually like, nah, nah, you're going to leave the soda, leave the Gatorade because water's free kids, water's free. And we're not going to pick the snack. We're going to get the apples. And, you know, a lot of times we're like, oh, but the good chips are more expensive. Yes, they are. Which means buying sometimes don't buy them every time. You shouldn't have those in your cart. Every time you go to the grocery store, peanut butter folks is cheap. Bread and peanut butter make an amazing breakfast and keeps you full longer, much longer than Captain Crunch cereal. Um, so what I usually do, I sit down with my patients that are on limited budgets and we actually go through all the foods that they're eating, which is usually pasta, carbs, uh, waffles, chips, crackers, you know what I'm saying? It's all beige foods. And then I'm like, okay, well, if we eat beans instead of that, so stop buying that, do more beans. Instead of that, we're going to do peanut butter. Instead of that, we're going to do some fruits and vegetables. And I've been able to stay within people's budgets with no problem. It doesn't tell them cooking. It doesn't tell them pulling up a recipe. So it is a little more difficult. I've even in one of my blog posts, I went to Costco, Walmart, Target, and Trader Joe's. And I priced all the foods and compared organic to to uh, regular priced uh, foods. And there was not that much of a difference. And then I also took an organic homemade burger versus Wendy's meal pack. And the organic homemade burger was actually cheaper than the Wendy's. Because when we look at it, you're like, oh, when I go to Wendy's, it's $3.49, let's say, for the meal pack. But when I go and get organic beef, it's going to be like, you know, $12.00. Well, right, because you're going to make like 20 burgers out of that, you know, and then when you get a pack of eight buns, that is eight burgers out of that. When you get a pack of cheese is eight burgers out of that. But we, our mind is like 345 versus my $25 grocery bill. Do you know what I'm saying? And we're, we have a hard time going, oh, I can make that over time. So I do I actually work with people. And I, I think it is a it's a mindset. And people just don't know. And when you walk with them step one, one step at a time, huge difference. Um, I see a lot of questions or a few asking what um, your thoughts are, or what types of practical changes should we make to better integrate holistic medicine into allopathic medicine and whether or not you see us moving towards a holistic approach in the future and kind of how to integrate that into our lives do you have and what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think the it's times are changing. Absolutely. We are in a different place now than we were 10 years ago and people are starting to pay attention. I have more and more doctors going like, what are you doing? Like, what is the information on that? What's going on there? Um, so I'm seeing people perk up and really start paying more and more attention to the functional medicine, if you will. There's still plenty of doctors that are like, that's a bunch of hooey. It's not, it's not proven in any way. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, that's why we just do you. But simple ways, think of the basics, like everything we just talked about, like the movement, the social media, screen times, vitamin D, in our in our clinic, we want to get a shirt that says it can be this easy because we get trained, you know, we're like the fancy medicines, the fancy interventions. You need this fancy stethoscope. You need this. Fan so we're like, oh, it needs to be like really fancy and really for it to work. No, it doesn't. Like an apple a day legit keeps the doctor away. Legit. Okay. There's a lot coming through. So I'm trying to scroll back up. <laughs> and see um someone asked are organic foods any better or is that just really good marketing organic foods are actually lots of good info in my book on that um or with a lot of great i'm a complete nerd so there's tons of studies that i actually quote in my book to show that organic produce is it is actually better than regular produce because um it just even the nutritional value is not huge. The nutritional value is a little more than in the conventional. However, the pesticides and herbicides 
have shown to have such tremendous impact on children, on ADHD, neurocognitive issues, behavioral issues, cancer, asthma, allergies, the list goes on and on. However, if I'm going to say, but I can, I can't afford organic. I'm like, well, put the chips away and just get regular produce. The regular produce is going to be far better than your Doritos. Um, someone asked, um, a more specific question. They had orthodontic surgery last February and they're still experiencing hair loss. Is there anything you may recommend in terms of lifestyle changes for teenagers or young adults to pay attention to maintain healthy hair and skin? So. Right. Goes back to all the things that we just talked about, um, you know, looking, so if you were coming to the clinic, we would go right to the beginning. I would go right through your whole diet history. A lot of times our body, you know, I treated my body very poorly. My diet in medical school was Pop-Tarts and Diet Coke for breakfast. And that may also have been lunch, just saying. <laughs> so, you know, when, and then my body was doing fine. I was fine, I was feeling fine. And then there was one incident when my body was like shut down and was done. And that sometimes often happens. We're like, we're eating our ramen noodles, we're eating our Doritos, we may be drinking, we may not be drinking, we're doing whatever. And then you have orthodontic surgery and the body stress is so high that it sends you reeling. And all of a sudden it's uncovering, you know, you're bare, like basically walking a thin line and then it's pushed you over the edge by having that surgery. So I would go back to the basics, nutrition and your stress. Uh, there's not a specific supplement. You cannot out supplement a bad diet. You cannot take enough vitamin D if you're eating Wendy's, you can't. Um, this question says, what is your opinion on different types of diets and eating programs like intermittent fasting and the keto diet? And what do you say to individuals that state that calories in and calories out is all that matters for weight management. So what are your thoughts on dieting? And yeah, so, you know, each human is very different. You know, there's, I agree, there's so many diets out there and there's so many opinions, but, and keto diet works for some and not for others. Intermittent fasting works for some people and not for others. Uh, always be careful of falling for, this is the panacea. I mean, if you want to try it, absolutely give it a go, but don't be surprised if it doesn't work for you because not everybody should be on paleo, not everybody should be a vegan, not everybody should um, should do um, keto because each human is very different. So we need to listen to our bodies. I don't agree that calories are just calories. It depends on what kind of calories. So the quality of the calorie is important. And of course, portion size. I mean, I, though I've not had anyone that just ate so many vegetables that they gained weight. I don't have anyone. I have had kids that ate so many apples as in 12 apples a day and they were gaining weight. And the problem was they weren't full. And then we added peanut butter to their apples and their apple consumption decreased by over 75% because we're able to feed the body. The so the child was eating apples because they were nutrient deficient and she kept trying to get her nutrients from this food, but you can't. And so we changed, I changed her diet by adding in this example, nut butter in her snacks. And that was her weight came under control, the amount of apples. And, you know, it was a lot of people are like, wait, but you gave her peanut butter and she lost weight, right? Because we were feeding, we were putting the right nutrients in the right person. Um, Kayla asked, oh, where'd it go? Oh, well, let me do this one before it came first. Um, when you were speaking about eczema, does the same process of detox apply to lessening keratosis pilaris? Uh, I'm sorry, you broke up. Can you repeat one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. It says when you were speaking about eczema, does the same process of detox apply to lessening keratosis pilaris? Yes. And all, cause all inflammation. So some folks have keratosis pilaris, some people have eczema, some people have acne, some people have psoriasis. It's still skin inflammation and it still goes back to the inflammation inside your body. Yes. Awesome. Um, some people are asking maybe like how to start this approach because a lot of people may not have the same opportunities or the same things as other people. Like somebody said in Flint, water 
is hard, isn't free. And some places like they have trouble getting to more healthy food. So is there um, maybe like a good beginning path for people that don't have as many opportunities? Right. So I would start with the things, you know, what was the water that the water is not free? Um, let me find it. Yeah, I mean, we do pay for water technically. I mean, um, somebody said water isn't free in Flint. I think they were just saying that some of these things are harder for others to right, access. Right, right. I mean, yeah, you have to pay for water, otherwise, turn your water off. I mean, that is technically true. Um, but no, so the people live in food deserts, and it is, it's a horror that we're the wealthiest country in the world, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and we have garbage to offer a lot of the people. That is a huge problem. But in the era of delivery services, now everybody delivers, Walmart delivers. So actually one of the things I do downloads on is, so all peppered through my book is actually down links uh, to Walmart uh, options and target options. So you can have them actually delivered to your house. So if you live in the middle of nowhere, you can actually get delivery to your house of great foods. And you don't have to shop at Whole Foods. Um, right now, we're in the process of making lists from Aldi's where they have a ton of great products as well. So we, those could be also, I don't know if they deliver, so I don't call me on that one, but I know Walmart, Target, uh, and Costco, I have them delivered. And a lot of people say, oh no, you can't get Costco delivery. It's actually $3.99 and then I tip the person and it saves me hundreds of dollars because when my Instacart shopper goes and buys myself from Costco, they're not in the TV aisle. They're not in the saw aisle. So they only stick with, they buy whatever's on the list. When I go to Costco for a piece of broccoli, I come home with a $300 bill because I'm all over the aisles getting all kinds of stuff and I'm not making fun of it, but my point is there's all these um, areas, all these deliverable. The other, my favorite one is Thrive Market. Amazing deals for unorganic products that comes to your house. They're dried goods for, um, you can join a local farm, a local CSA, a local co-op. There's Azure Standard. Azure Standard comes out of California. And if you get a buying group with people, they will actually bring a truck of organic foods down the road from you and everybody can get it. So it does take creativity. It does take ingenuity. It takes effort. It is much easier to go to Wendy's through a drive, I'm beating up on Wendy's. But if you go to McDonald's and through the drive-through and grab a burger, then come home and you know cook a burger. 100%. The other thing that our mamas that are working three jobs is happening, their children are sitting on devices doing nothing while the mom is working three jobs, coming home and trying to take care of the house because we have uh, created an environment for our children. Excuse me, one second. I'm sorry. It's so annoying. Sorry, I didn't realize my phone is in here and it's so annoying. Okay, um, so one of the things that I see in families when the moms are running themselves ragged is that they are not uh, delegating to their children. They, the children should be washing dishes. They should be doing laundry. They should be cooking. My children have to cook. Is it great? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Do they complain? 100%. Do they complain about dishes? Every single night, but they have to do their laundry. I mean, they're work in progress. Are they angels? No. Am I still doing too much? Totally. But in my, my point being is that we are very eager to say it's too hard because delegation is hard. When you are so stressed from working so many jobs and you come home, the last thing you want to do is like, tell that one to do this, tell that one to do that. It needs to become an expectation. And we have enabled our children. I'm speaking now as a mom of teenage children. We have enabled our children to just kind of live the good life while we are running ourselves ragged. And so of course you're gonna do fast food. Oh, my favorite, they are doing a million sports. You don't need to do a million sports. Why do you need a million sports? You do one sport and it's a pandemic. So you don't even do that now. Again, we're treating our children like royalty and we're driving ourselves into the ground and then we're using convenience food to make our life easier. Alice asked, the things that you read online about nutrition, how much of it can you trust? Like what sort of websites are accurate and maybe how to check what's the best information? Um, you know, I usually go to PubMed. 
whenever I'm in doubt, I go to PubMed and it needs to be in PubMed. And I'm looking, there's, I, where I use articles that have only a few people in it. I use articles that have thousands of people in it, but that where I, whenever I see something on a blog, I never believe the blog. I go to their resource and oftentimes you'll see that it's not even well resourced. And I'm always, I'm always on PubMed. Currently I'm working on, on a natural mineral. People have asked about eczema. So I was all over PubMed today, but that's where I get my information. That's good. Um, really quickly, just because what people have asked in the chat, um, the link will be sent out after the questions are done and we start to wrap up and it'll be open for about 30 minutes afterwards. So that'll be sent soon, just to address that really quickly. Sure. Um, let's see. Somebody asked earlier, how would you integrate holistic approaches into like a, a allopathic approach? Like how would you not necessarily go towards that route, but still integrate it into your sure. daily job? Sure. And actually I did that. I did that for six years is I started doing um, integrative, if you will. So when people would come in during their checkups, they actually, because you, I only had like 15 minutes with folks, they would have a um, sheet that they would have to fill out. It was color coded. It was like, how many vegetables you eat a day, how many fruits, how much screen time, how much water, you know? So quickly I could actually go through um, what's, how they're doing. And if there was an area that was really deficient, it. It's really clever, I have to say. So it was all color coded. So if they're deficient in water, let's say, and that was green. I actually had a green handout that went with water and then they would get um, a whole handout to take home about how to increase water in their daily life <clears throat> without me spending 60 minutes talking about water because in a 15 minute awesome. appointment, you have to be really fast. Um, there would be things like, okay, the kid would come in with asthma. And so we would talk about vitamin D. I would obviously do the regular, do you need albuterol? Do you need inhaled steroids? Okay, let's talk about, you know, uh, your diet really quick. One thing, that's where the one thing comes into place. You're going to pick one thing. So you know that you might know the family are just like, great. Well, how much um, soda are you drinking today? They're drinking a ton of soda great, I'm going to need you to decrease your soda intake while I'm treating your asthma. And here's a little vitamin D. And you can make this really quick. You just have to ask the right questions and be in the mindset, the mindset that just ask them to change one thing. Um, I think this is going to be the last question since we're nearing 355 or Central. Um, and Kaylee said, what are your thoughts on doing the DO model instead of MD since they have a more holistic approach if you're interested in that kind of medicine? Yeah, you know what? I I don't know. I mean, I know I have some colleagues that do DO, so, but I'm not well versed in the curriculum. But you know, I have been thinking in my head, I'm like, would I, if I could do it all over again, would I do the DO model? You know, I think it's great. I think it's a great idea to do that. As I said, I don't have enough information on it. One of the things that um, is a little difficult is that the DO license is really well accepted in some states and not well accepted in other states. That's it. It's just kind of um, MD gives you a bigger ability to do stuff. Is it? That's really, so if you want to be running a hospital, if you want to be the head of whatever, but you can own your own clinic as a DO, you can, you can do all these things as a DO, but again, it depends on the state you're in because it's, and whether or not it's well accepted or not. Here comes dog. Hi dog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that's the end of our questions. Do you have anything else you want to say? And then I'll wrap up with the certification stuff at the end. Awesome. Um, the so don't be. It's a lot. It's a lot of information, and that's why I wanted started. You know, our number one point is being open minded. Where there's a will, there's a way. People are always going to give you obstacles. They're all, you know, kind of like we talked about the water and the food scarcity and whatever. And it's a matter of, we obviously have to be empathetic. I don't, 
we're dealing in a teaching model, but with somebody, we would have the empathy and the hardship and we would listen with them. But where there's a will, there's a way. There's always a way to overcome it. Unfortunately, it's massive undertaking. And it's just much easier in a 10 minute appointment to give somebody an antibiotic or an ADHD medicine or prescription for anxiety pill. It is much easier. I can write a, a prescription for Ritalin in less than 30 seconds. And then I would spend the, like the other nine and a half minutes talking about shoes. It was that fast. So it is an undertaking and it needs to be the mindset. If in your mindset, you're like, I will change the world. I will change the life of the person in front of me. I promise you, you're going to find a way. If you're like, this is really hard. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's so hard. You're exhausted. You haven't slept in days. You have so many things going on. It's hard. You move on. The next day you try again. But I promise you, if your mindset is, I will change, I will change this person's life, and I'm going to do it one life at a time. I'm going to do it one tip at a time. You'll be amazed at the effect that you're going to have on the people around you, on the world. Instead of, I can't just change it to, I can, I will, and I will find a way. And I promise you, your patients are going to be so thankful. I love that so much. Um, so thank you once again, Dr. Anna Maria. We absolutely loved having you. Um, I am about to send the link to the Google form in the chat. So if you just go to it, you just need to put your email, your name, and kind of how you heard about ISPR. And just thank you all for joining us. And just a reminder that this session, along with every other session that we've had, is on our YouTube channel, which is the International Society of Pre-Health Researchers. So definitely go check that out. Um, and just thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you so much. So appreciate it.